Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So my name's Anna Middleton, and I'm um, Head of Society and Ethics Research in Cambridge at the Wellcome Genome Campus, where the Sanger Institute is. The Sanger Institute, the home of uh, Sanger Sequencing, where there are thousands, literally thousands, of scientists and bioinformaticians. Um, and I'm uh, one of a, a very small group of social scientists. And when Alistair said earlier, um, patients need to be heard, well, social scientists listen. Um, a lot of what we do as social scientists, particularly on the campus, is ask patients for their views, their values, their beliefs, their thoughts about genetics and genomics and how they want the technology to be used. Um, I'm also a genetic counsellor, so I've come from clinic. I worked for 10 years in the NHS working with families with genetic conditions. And I feel as if that experience um, guides a lot of the way that I approach research. So I'm going to give an overview of why data sharing, particularly in the genomics world, is necessary. What are the perceived risks from donating your data? Because always there's a person behind the data that is eventually shared. And then I'm going to end with um, some preliminary findings from our attitude research that we've done on um, public and patient attitudes towards genomic data sharing. So why is genomic data sharing necessary? Well, really, it's because um, in order to fulfill the potential of genomics, you have to have a lot of data to look at. So that means a lot of people have to donate their data. And if you're going to look at the DNA of an individual person, in order to be able to interpret it properly, you have to be able to compare it to the DNA from thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands, even millions of other people. And those people need to be from different ethnicities. Um, they need to be a whole mixture of people, some of whom will have the same clinical condition as perhaps your patient does, and some of whom may be perfectly healthy and have no disease. But those comparisons need to be made if you're going to interpret what a variant means uh, in an individual. So there's a lot of people that need to donate data to give permission for their DNA and their medical records to be accessed and to be used by others. And when data is donated, often it's done in a de-identified form, so names, addresses, dates of birth are removed and you just have the data there to be accessed from databases. Those databases might be publicly available, all those databases might be authorised and you need to get, get a key to access them. <coughs> so what are genomic databases being used for? Well, many different things. They're being accessed every second around the world. So it could be used within clinic, um, within a clinical health care setting, so medical doctors, bioinformaticians might be wanting to know, is my patient's genome result the same as someone else's? does this condition look like it's caused by the variant that we found in this person's sample? Could be used in non-profit research. What's the prevalence of a particular genetic change across the UK, for example? Could be used in for-profit research for the development of medicine. Is this particular medicine working in people with a particular genetic change? Lots of different types of databases, lots of different types of data. How would you describe all of that to the public in order to be able to ask questions of them about it? And given that we know that 90% um, or so of the public have never even heard of the word genomics before, have no concept of the spread of genomics through healthcare at the moment, no idea that genomic technology is now being mainstreamed on a massive scale, and that it's not only in the specialist clinical genetics services, it's now in dermatology, ENT, paediatrics, obstetrics, oncology. How would you explain all of that to somebody who has no concept really of this? So we've had a go. Um, and a lot of what we do is to try and find what hooks, what metaphors, what memes, what phrases do people find resonate for them within this area? And I've been exploring a lot of how to do this using film. Um, so I'm going to just share with you one of the little films that we've created that sit within a survey 
that we use to gather attitudes. And this is a public survey. And this describes what genomic data sharing is. Without using the word genomics, we use the word DNA instead. We know that the public have heard of the word DNA. And without talking about databases, but using the metaphor of shelves um, in a playroom, of a child's playroom representing databases. So see what you think. <laughs> DNA and medical information sit in databases. It's used to answer questions about health and disease. Hi, I'm a medical doctor. I'm a scientist. And I represent a pharmaceutical company. Any of us may need to access the DNA and medical information in the database. But none of us know who the information belongs to because all names have been removed. As you can see, some contain the information we need. It's like collecting pieces of a jigsaw. And some we cannot open because we do not have the right key from the gatekeeper. Would you like to see a readout of your DNA information? Databases are accessed via the web. DNA and medical information are accessed every second. Okay, so we um, have a survey with a series of films that are like that and they give you enough information to pique your interest and hopefully um, engage you enough to, to stay with the survey and answer your questions. Um, hopefully they don't bias your views, they just give you enough to orientate you with the subject and then share your views. And this is a piece of work for Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that Mark mentioned uh, earlier. So that's a great organisation that has incredible people from around the world trying to make data sharing possible um, and enable data sharing to happen. And um, I realised as a social scientist that there was a um, voice from the patient and the public missing. And so hence we set up this study um, to try and gather some attitudes from the public towards this. And this particular research is being translated into many different languages. And if you've got any um, ideas or languages that you'd like to see this survey in, please let me know because there's an offer of um, first author articles if you want to... Um, translate an arm. The Russian translation is going to be one of the first ones to come out at the end of the summer. Um, so what are the risks of donating data? So if we were going to ask somebody, please will you donate your data for research or for use by others? Um, really, when you actually have an electronic form of, of DNA, it looks something like this. It's not as if you can really look at that and say, oh, this person's got an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, you need specialist software to overlay on top of this and interpret this. Um, but the risks that um, are thought about in terms of data donating and data uh, consequent sharing is that there's a theoretical risk that the person who donate, donated the data could be identified from it. So although their data has their name and address often severed from it, there may be a link to that data that somebody holds back to the person information, um, there's always a theoretical risk that their data could be hacked maliciously or it could even be accidentally, and that somehow there could be a link between the two made, particularly if people have got a lot of other personal information online. So this is thought to be one of the problems with donating data, is that there's this risk, very small risk, in theory, of being able to be identified from it. And actually, you know, when we think about our DNA data, it is our most personal profile. It's more personal to us than an iris scan or a fingerprint. So we do need to take the security of it very, very seriously. So I'm interested in what people think about this. What do they perceive the risks to be? So we've done this survey. Um, we explore lots of different things to do with perceived harms, perceived risks. Um, awareness of this whole industry going on. What does trust look like? Um, if you're going to donate to your data, what makes you trust the process, the system? Is it a white lab coat? Is it a fancy website? Is it very clear guidance on sanctions that would be in place if there were data breaches? So these are things that we're exploring as well. And this is the survey. And we have little <coughs> Charlie in here who uh, invites you to participate. 
Um, and then you work through the survey and along the right hand side um, are the different sections of the survey. So we've got the first thousand or so responses in and I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the data. This is very much preliminary, it only came in yesterday morning. Um, so <laughs> I was busy yesterday um, and I'm hoping for about 10,000 or so responses in total. But so just this is, gives you a little flavour. We've got a spread already of ages, demographics, 50-50 men and women. Most of the people um, who filled in the survey know absolutely nothing about genomics already. They're completely disconnected from this. And you might say, well, why is this even relevant to them? If they're not engaging with health services or research at the moment, why do they even need to know about this or comment on it? Well, the thing about DNA and genomics is that any result that comes back to an individual is, of course, it could be relevant to biological relatives as well. And there is this urgent need, even if you're not currently using health services, somebody you are biologically related to probably is. And we need to be able to sort of raise consciousness about what genomics can do for us as individuals and help families to talk about what testing they've had, why it might be relevant for other people, share information about risks to ourselves. And that's another thing that we're looking at in our department is how to, for example, engage popular culture to start conversations in families about genomics. Anyway, in this sample, 57% uh, or so knew nothing about genomics. And the rest who took part um, were either health professionals, researchers, or patients who were currently engaging in this field. So one of the things I was quite keen to look at right at the beginning in the survey is, is genomic data special or different to other sorts of data that you might have online? And I of, often get a sense from working in this industry that we, we feel that genomics is incredibly special, this data. It links people to each other. It contains data about our past, present and future health. It's incredibly special. But do other people see it as special or do they just see it as data? So one of our first questions was trying to orientate people with the concept of just having online data and genomic data just being added onto that. So the question was, let's assume you have the following personal information online. Holiday photographs, your bank account details, your medical information and your DNA information. And we explained clearly what that was. So let's assume it's online. Do you think these pieces of information should have the same levels of protection against unauthorised use? So that gives you an idea of comparing pieces of data um, between you know, each other. Is there something that's a little bit more risky? Would you be more worried about it if it was hacked? And most people across the board thought that their bank account details required the most level of protection. So what they're saying is, I'm more worried about my banking de details being hacked than I am really about my medical or my DNA information. It's more, I can see a real risk from that and a real harm from that. And that was interesting, That's particularly interesting for me working in genomics, because I really was under the impression that genomics was incredibly special to people. Um, and when you think about the systems that are being created to protect this data, it is more secure than, you know, the banking system. Well, I, I exaggerate, but, you know, the really, the millions and millions of pounds that have been spent on um, making the most unhackable systems. And, of course, you're only one step ahead of the hackers anyway. Um, would you donate your data? And we presented three different scenarios. Would you donate your data for use by um, clinical people to help get a diagnosis in a patient, for use by non-profit researchers, and for use by for-profit researchers. And this is where we found a difference between the responses from the patients and the health professionals who knew something about genomics versus the public who are currently very disconnected from it. So here we've got the results from those who know something about genomics, either through their work or through being a patient. So they said, yes, I donate my DNA medical information. 70% said for use by medical doctors, 66% um, for use by non-profit, and then we start to drop off when it's for use by for-profit researchers. And the comments were pe from people were saying things like, um, if I donate my data freely, I don't like the idea of for-profit companies making money and exploiting me in some way. So that's kind of interesting because that sort of demonstrates a sense of, you know, do I, do I own my data after it's left me? 
and I should have some attachment to that and some decision-making process about who has access to it or not. And I'm sure Jonathan's going to talk in a minute about ownership and actually the reality of that is perhaps somewhat different from what people perceive. Um, and then the results from the public were the same pattern but significantly less of them. So yes, some of them would still donate but um, less than half of them would donate for these three different situations. So there was this idea that if you're connected to the field, you're more likely to be altruistic and say, I'd like to donate my data. There was definitely a concern about a farmer making profits from free donation, and those who know about genomics are more likely to donate. What about being identified? So this is this potential risk if you did choose to donate. Are people worried about that? Um, and if so, what are their worries? What do they think can happen if they're identified. So if you think back to that previous image I showed of all the just the rows of data, say that was your data and that was online and your name and address and phone number was attached to it, what harm could actually in reality happen? Um, so we said let's assume your anonymous DNA information was publicly available so anybody could access it. It's on anonymous. But let's say someone then linked your name and address and phone number to it, do you think you could be harmed? If yes, what concerns you most? And a lot of people said, I don't really think there is too much harm from this, but some said, yeah, I'd be worried about this. And the biggest concerns were being targeted for marketing. <coughs> um, which I think is actually really interesting. <laughs> I mean, the, the other answers are insurance discrimination, employer discrimination, being stigmatised in some way. And these come up all the time when you talk to anybody about genetics, or will I be discriminated against on the basis of my genetics? And given that we have a moratorium in the UK, you should not be. Um, insurance companies aren't allowed to ask you the results of a genetic test. They are allowed to ask you about your family history. But certainly targeting for marketing is not something that I would have particularly labelled as the biggest concern. And we're being targeted for marketing all the time, aren't we? Um, so interesting that this came up in this context. So these are just some, I, I ha I've, there's loads of results I could have shared with you. I've just picked a few because I know I've only got 10 minutes. So some preliminary conclusions. Some people are okay about donating their data for use by others, but less keen on its use for profit research. Um, believing there's a potential for exploitation affects interest in donating. However, actual exploitation <coughs> in reality might be very different, and that's up for debate. And uh, we're going to be keeping this survey open for the next couple of years, um, and it's going to be translated into lots of different languages, so we're we'll collecting loads of data about this for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And this is the website at the bottom, yourdnayoursay.org. Your Thank you.